Not that one. Another laptop. There we go. There we go. So just before everyone comes in, let me just do a quick introduction to who I am. Um, so as Ian said, my name's John Spooner. My role at H2O is the, I'm the Director of Solution Engineering for Europe. So anything technical that um, we have to do at H2O in uh, Europe, my, me and my team uh, look to sort out. So I've been in the space of data science uh, for over 20 years now. In fact, way before the term data science existed. So I've worked for a number of organizations, but the last company that I worked for was a software company called SAS, and I was the head of data science there. I've been at H2O now for just coming up to a year, and I'm really excited about what we're doing as a company and what we're doing um, with regards to growing our footprint uh, within the European region. What I am going to have the pleasure of doing for the next couple of hours is to walk you through a hands-on experience of driverless AI. So when I first started in software, I actually started in education teaching training courses, and the biggest training course I ever taught was I had about 15 people on a training course. So this is by far the biggest training course that I've ever taken. So do bear with us with regards to any technical glitches. We do think we've solved them all, but that's famous last words. So what we're going to do is get you up and running on driverless AI. Um, we're going to work through some data sets, work through some demonstrations, it's going to be a bit like I do a bit, then you do a bit, can ask some questions, then I do a little bit more, then you do a little bit more, and we'll break it up like that, rather than just me drill on for um, minutes and minutes. So first of all, hopefully you've all managed to get a network connection. It is crucial you get a network connection. We're not going to be installing software on your laptops because we... We don't want to uh, waste time. What we want to do is get you up and running quickly. And the game plan for this particular session is as follows. We're going to get you up and running on driverless AI. We're then going to introduce you into the data sets that you're going to play around with. And then really it's showtime. Showtime for me, showtime for you. Time to get your hands on um, the product. So. First of all, what you need to do is get onto the training environment. The training environment is called Aquarium. You may now have started to notice a little bit of a pattern going on with our naming convention. Um, so we've got sparkling water, we've got Aquarium, we've also got um, an environment called Puddle. Um, so no prizes for guessing the theme. But if you navigate to aquarium.h2o.ai, that should get you to a logon screen that looks like this. If you go to, there's a button there that cr allows you to create a new account. If you go and create that account, it will then ask you for a few logon details in terms of your name, your organization, uh, your country and your email address. Your email address is important because that's where your um, password is going to get sent to. So this is allowing you access to Aquarium. And, and then just get to the point where you can log on to Aquarium and get to the dashboard. So let's go back again. If you could go to aquarium.h2o.ai, create a new account. And once you've created that new account, get a password sent to you, and then get to your dashboard. And then once you've done that, raise your hand. OK, wait. This is my sophisticated way of knowing how many people in the room have actually got to this particular stage. Um, so I'll give it uh, one more minute, get you logging on. Again, anyone got to the dashboard? Put your hands up. As soon as we get to about 75%, 
uh, we'll continue. So aquarium.h2o.ai. Okay, once you've got to that particular point and you've got to the dashboard, what you will see in the top left-hand corner is it will say Browse Labs. Click on Browse Labs and then you will go to a screen that looks like this that has a number of lab IDs associated to it. What you have to do is to click on David Whiting's Driverless AI One GPU Lab, which is Lab ID 4. And it's crucial you go into that lab ID because I haven't set up the other labs. So you need to go to that, click on View Detail, choose that lab, and then once you get there, you will have an option to start the lab. Click on Start Lab, and that will get you to a screen that looks a little bit like... Oh. Let me just log in. So you log in, go to Browse Labs, go to lab number four, view detail, and then you get to a screen that looks like this and you click Start Lab. That will then give you, as you scroll down, access to a machine name, an AWS machine name. That's your AWS environment with driverless AI on it. If you click on that, and then it will ask you to log in to that environment. If you do have challenges, please don't click on End Lab. Just give it a little bit of time, and then click on the link again. So hopefully, you've got to a point where you start the lab, you click on the driverless AI URL that gets you into Let me just, we'll get you into this logon screen. There are two logons, but the logon that I want to use for this particular training already has some data sets on there, will already have some experiments on there, and will already have some visualization and interpretability on there as well. So to do that, you have to log on as user training and password training. So it's quite easy to remember. So your username is training, your password is training. Click on Sign In. And then you should get to a point where you probably have to agree to some terms and conditions. I've already uh, done that. And then you should get to this data sets overview. Once you get to that particular point, we'll then start the training. So has everyone progressed? Any chat? Who's at that point? Excellent. Just uh, 30 more seconds. Okay. So as you're logging through that, let me just explain some of, some of the features that we're, we're going to be looking at. So we're going to be going through building a machine learning model in the way that Marius um, talked about. And what Marius did did was a great job of explaining the inner workings of driverless AI. For driverless AI, for some people, it seems a lot like magic. And there's not many people that will want to run their business on magic. So what he hopefully did was give you the confidence that there's a lot of science that has been put behind the building of this particular product. But the way that you interact with it, we want to make it as simple as possible. So there are lots of different settings that you can play around with with driverless AI. And we are going to just touch the surface in this particular training. But the first key thing that you really need to think about is how do you tune experiments? So really, you as data scientists are the mechanic equivalent to our software. It's up to you to fine tune the software to run quickly and get to a highly accurate result. You can run it out of the box, and you'll get really good results. But your skill in this is to tweak it to really get those performance gains. 
So one of the ways that you can tweak the software is through some dials that you will see when we create an experiment. And these give you the ability to tweak the accuracy of the model, the time that it takes you to build a model, and how interpretable you want the model. One thing that we always find is that what a new user of driverless will do is ramp up the accuracy to 10, ramp up the time to 10, and turn down the interpretability to 1, i.e., give me the most accurate model, I don't care how long I take, and I really don't care how interpretable it is. And then they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait a little bit more. And then they phone up tech support and say, I've broken it. Basically, what you're doing there is really getting into a car, putting your foot on the accelerator, and wheel spinning. So what I would recommend is you don't go straight with the 10 10 one option. What we try and do is to stop people doing that by when you bring in your data, set some default, sensible default values. But what we find is everyone just changes those um, anyway. But just to let you know, there is some science to those particular settings. And these are some of the dimensions that we look, about, look at. All of this is documented. If you go to docs.h2o.ai, feel free to have a look at the user guide. You can see everything that's going on uh, within the product. We're incredibly transparent um, about what we're doing. So you can start to see, as you increase your accuracy levels, we're doing less and less sampling. Um, so if we've got very large data tables, maybe with billions and billions of rows, then some of those accuracy settings are going to sample the data um, down. It's controlling what level ensemble, joining together of models that we're doing, parameter tuning levels, how many folds from a cross-validation we're working with. With time, it controls the number of iterations that we're go going through, and we'll see some of this um, in more detail. And then from interpretability, um, it looks at different types of transformations. Basically, the more interpretable you want a model, so probably the more regulated your industry is that you work in, the higher you want that dial. So those, that's the first thing to, to, rem to remember. So what are we going to go through? Well, in the next, I don't know how long we've got left, next sort of an hour and a half, we're going to really go through these five areas. We're going to look at some data first of all. We're going to visualize it. We're going to build some models. We're going to do some interpretability. And then we're going to do some freestyling, i.e., you can do whatever you want. OK? We're doing it based on there are two key uh, data tables. Um, One's a credit card data, and it isn't customer churn. It's uh, some credit card data that looks at how likely someone is to default on a loan. And the data set that we're going to look at is card train. There is an opportunity to do some sales forecasting as, as well. So because we are based in Mountain View, then we're actually looking at a very unusual data set called Cannabis Train. So California is a state in America that marijuana is legalized. So what we're going to do is to look at some uh, cannabis data to look at forecasting the sales um, across a number of different organizations. So let's go into driverless AI. So this is the bit that what I will do, I will do a bit, navigate through driverless AI, Feel free to follow if you want, but the, at the end of each bit, I will stop and allow you to play around a little bit more, and then we'll go back onto uh, driverless uh, and, and show you some more. So, let's go. So, first, th first things first, we need to bring our data into driverless AI, and we've already done that uh, just to save some time. One of the questions that we did have, let me just go to um, the Slido. So if you do have any questions specifically, do feel free to ask them onto the Slido. I will be going back and forth to this. But one of the questions we did have 
um, was does driverless connect directly uh, with databases or data repositories such as Amazon S3, Cloud Storage, BigQuery? Well, the answer to that question is yes, it does. So when you click on Add Data Set, you get a link to all the connections that have currently been configured for your particular system. So in this system, we can see that we can, it's been connected to Amazon S3 um, and Hadoop, but we can also connect it to um, Azure Blobs uh, Big Data Query. You can upload CSV files into this data set area. So this is where you have the data. And the data that you want to analyze, you basically click for actions. And you have a number of different options. So let's have a look at this card underscore train. We can see it's two megabytes in size, nearly 24,000 rows, 25 columns. So we want to see a little bit more about that particular um, data table. To do that, you can click on Details. And if you click on Details, you get some summary statistics being calculated, and you get some graphical objects that will be the size and the shape of those will be determined by the data that's within there. And this is a really good start for you as a data scientist just to understand what data that you've got in there. So as Marius said, you do have to have your data in a certain format. So you do have to have it in an analytical data format with a target variable, the thing you're trying to predict, and some features. So one row per account, one row per customer, or one row per time point if you're doing time series forecasting. We don't have to impute missing values before bringing it into driverless AI. Driverless AI will do the imputation for us. Um, we don't have to do the conversion of character values into numeric. As Marius talked about, you have to do that conversion with machine learning models. Driverless will automatically do that for you. So for the column sex, we can see we've got as male, female, and other. Um, we don't have to bring that in and code it as one, two, or three. You can have a look at the data set itself by clicking on data set rows um, and, and just navigate through that. So that's the first thing that you can do, just really understand the details of the data. The next thing that you may want to do as you move through the building up of models is to then start to visualize your data. So if you click on Visualize, basically what happens is we do a visualization. So we've done the visualization up at the top. And if I click on that visualization, we will start to see what were the visualizations that driverless AI felt was useful for that particular data source. So what we've done is really switch visualization on its head. So traditionally with visualization tools such as Tableau or Click or the best business intelligence tool on the planet, Excel, what you have to do is take data, select what object you want to use to visualize that data, select it, have a look to see if there are any patterns, and then work out other ways potentially of visualizing it. What we've done here is to say, well, let's look at lots of different visualizations, and given the data, choose the best visualization. So when you run this on different data sets, you will get different visualizations available to you. So let's look at the outliers. If I go to the outliers plot, what I will see in the outliers plot is columns or variables or features, call them what you want, but you will see only the ones that have outline values associated to them. If a column doesn't appear in that, 
in that gallery, it doesn't have an outlier. So it enables you as a data scientist to really focus in on those variables that potentially are problematic or those variables that have got relationships to them. So rather than go through every single plot, what I'm going to do is just to stop for a few minutes and enable you to play around with some of those visualizations. Feel free, if you want to, to use some of these different data sets to do some visualizations. Feel free to look at um, different types of visualizations. I like the correlation graph because you can start to spin things around. You can see where variables are highly correlated with each other. If we sort of scroll through here, we can start to pick out those key correlations and, and spin that round. So have a play with that. If you do have any questions, then there will be some H2O people wandering around. They're sort of sitting at the back going, I really wish he hadn't said that. <laughs> um, so we'll be wandering around just to help you. If you do have any specific questions, though, and you can't grab one of us, just do write it on the um, Slido. We'll try and use this as a central pool of asking questions. What we are able to do at the end of this is collate all the questions and all the answers and get that to you as well. So um, feel free to play with those visualizations, just probably for about five minutes. Just gets you familiar with the interface. Um, and then we'll come back and build some uh, models.
Just a couple of more minutes finishing that off and then we'll make a start on the next bit. Hopefully, you, you've been up and playing around with the uh, product. Let's just go through a few of the questions that I had when, when wandering around. One person asked a question. They were in the correlated scatter plot, and they said, can you control the axes that are being displayed? Remember, this is a data-driven visualization tool. So only when a correlation exists between two variables will this object appear. So there's no control at this particular stage. If there were more than one correlation between variables, then you would see that. Notice at the moment we're just looking at those linear combinations. The size of these dots are important. Um, the larger the circle, the more observations that are there. One thing to point out about these visualizations, we are dealing with a fairly small data set at the moment, but these visualizations will scale. So if you've got millions of data points, then these visualizations will automatically scale themselves to make um, interpretability of those relationships easy. Again, one of the challenges that you have with visualization tools is sometimes the scale goes a bit doodally when you're dealing with real data. The work that Leyland's put into visualization over a number of years gets surfaced within this tool. Um, also, one thing that to note with this data is I don't have any missing data. And the reason that I know that is because if I did have missing data, I would see a missing heat map. Um, as well. So let me just quickly go to the uh, questions, see if there's any other questions that you've asked that sort of link to the visualization. No, no there isn't. So let's, on that point, let's go out of the visualizations and into the experiments. So you can go into different parts of driverless AI in different ways. So you can power everything from your data sets menu up in the, in the top and drive your whole analysis off that data set. Or you can go into individual areas. So if you wanted to drive your visualizations, you can create a new vis visualization from that screen. What we're going to do is go into experiments. What we're interested in doing is creating a new experiment. So if you click, um, what I'm going to do is click on the experiment. One thing that you do get is in driverless AI is a lot of help. Help in terms of the documentation online, but also in product help as well. So we can have a tour that looks at the main um, features. But in this case, rather than that help, you've got me to guide you through uh, the product. So we're still going to stick with uh, the credit card data. So let's go into card train. And then this is the data set that's going to get built or have a model built upon. So the first thing that it's asking for is basically a target column. So driverless isn't super, super clever. We do have to guide it. So we do have to specify what column do we want to predict. So that could be sales if we're dealing with a forecasting problem. In, it could be a categorical uh, target variable. It can be a continuous target variable. What I'm going to do is select on that field called default. That opens up 
the driverless AI dashboard. From that, you've got a number of different things that you can do. One thing that driverless does is prevents you from overfitting uh, models. So what we want to make sure is that we're giving you the guardrails to make sure you don't build this fantastic model or what you think is a fantastic model that when fitted on some holdout data will completely bum and you look a little bit daft in front of your stakeholders. So there are some internal metrics that enable you to control that. Um, it, it behind the scenes would do cross validation but you do if you've already got a validation data set. So other software vendors do have the ability to bring in a validation data set to evaluate the model as it's being built. You can do that by clicking on this validation data set area and choosing one of your data sets to be that validation data set. What you can also do is have a completely neutral data set with regards to your model building. So you can have a test data set where we know the outcome, but driverless will not use that at any point of the process of building a model, evaluating features, and evaluating algorithms. So for this particular data, we've got some test data set that's got the same structure, a target variable and features, but um, it's not going to be used in the building of that model. Driverless will look at all columns in that data set and consider them for use unless you specify dropped columns. So that it may be that you know that there are some uh, variables or features that you don't want to utilize. You can drop those. So how do you then interact with driverless? But well, here are those dials that I talked about earlier. You can click on the pluses and the minuses that allow you to alter those particular settings. What they're doing behind the scenes is controlling different parts of the model building process. And on the left-hand side, we give you some indicators of what's what is actually happening when you change those dials up and down. So as you increase the accuracy, different training data sets are going to be used, different algorithms are going to be used to evaluate the features and evaluate the models. When we run through the model build process, we need to be evaluating it on something and calculating a accuracy value or goodness of fit statistic or terminology that we use, we want to evaluate it against the scorer. So there are a number of scorers that are available for you to utilize. So you may have been building models before and you want to mac maximize the accuracy or maximize the genie value, maximize the area under the curve. So you as a user can uh, change that, that score that the model evaluates on. So that's the simplest way of interacting with driverless AI. So while we want to create driverless as a black box approach to running a model, we don't want it to be black box in terms of tuning. We want you as a data scientist to have different levels of tuning um, the process. So the way that we open that up in terms of the process is through the expert settings area. If we go to the expert settings, what you will start to see is all of the options that you can change when an experiment then runs. Well, actually, that's technically incorrect. It's the second level of things you can change. There is a, a config file underneath driverless AI called config.toml that allows you to control every single bit of driverless and how it's running. And this is really beneficial for data scientists that really want to squeeze the extra juice of the product and really tune driverless AI. They ca you can get to the inner workings of driverless AI. 
what we've tried to do is give you a step change of getting in involved in that. So we'll start off with some high level settings of those dials, then more of the expert settings. So you can turn algorithms on and off. You can decide um, what configurations you want the feature engineering to go through. There's a whole range of options available in there. I'm not going to go through all of those on this particular training because I want you to get hands-on playing around with that. The accuracy of... Uh, accuracy of five, sorry. It all it is being driven by how the data, if the, this data set was very large, the accuracy would be controlled by some su subsampling of, of, of the data. So if, let me just go back to this particular slide. So an accuracy of five basically says maximum amount of data that goes through this algorithm will be 200 million observations. Um, then, sorry, not 200 million observations. The combination of rows and columns um, has to add up to 200 million. It's going to be doing one level ensembling. So if we didn't want to do an ensemble model, we'd just turn that to uh, four. It will look at a target transformation. There will be some hyperparameter tuning going on. There will be a cross validation going on with three or four folds. Um, only first fo fold model. Not sure what that is. But then it does a, a distribution check. So this distribution check is really important because the distribution check is saying, let's have a look at the distribution of data in my training data set and make sure it's the same as the distribution of my validation data set and the distribution of my test data set. Because if it's not, any discrepancies that I see within the results could be due to the di a distribution shift. So, so as you change your accuracy levels, it will depend on what internal settings get changed. Okay? Really, the accuracy and time do link together. Because the higher the accuracy setting is, the longer that the thing will take to run. Yes. So, so time, we, it goes through iterations. I'll talk about iterations um, in a minute. And then interpretability, again, it all depends on what transformations are being used behind the scenes and what fe uh, feature engineering. All this is available uh, within the documentation. What we try and do, though, is to give a high-level view on this left-hand side of what is actually changing. Sometimes when you change it, depending on the data set, uh, sometimes things don't look like they've changed. Yeah, so, that, so when I first brought this data set into the experiment, those dials were controlled based on some high-level settings that it looks at the original data set and says these are good default values. Okay, so what I would always recommend is bring it in, then just go with the defaults first of all. Don't try and think you can outsmart driverless. Just go with the defaults first, launch the experiment, and then start to tune. Um, so once you're at a point where you think you're happy, Oh. You then click on Launch Experiment. And off the experiment goes. And what it starts to do is pick up certain patterns within the data. So at the bottom, you will get some notifications of what's actually happening. Um, so in this particular case, basically what's happened is it says it's recognized an ID variable and it's dropping that um, from the uh, analysis. So here we go, 27 seconds, I think it was, and we had one model. 
Now what's happening is it's going through that process that um, Marius expertly talked through in terms of it's going through the process of engineering features that make this model more predictive. We can start to see how well this model is performing with regards to uh, an accuracy statistic and we've also got an ROC curve and our area under the curve statistic being quoted here. And what's happening is we're iteratively going through that process. What we can start to see in the middle is which variables are the important drivers for this particular model. We can also start to see at the top at what level are we at. So we can start to see here we're at an XG boost model and it's going through a parameter and feature tuning method. If you look at those variable importance um, variables, you can start to see some features that have got uh, prefixes associated to them. Those are variables that have been created as part of the automatic feature engineering capability of driverless AI. So the raw variables are there, so you can start to see bill amount one, uh, status one, and status two are all the original variables, but then you've got the main variable is a, a numeric to cate categorical target encoder for marriage. And we're just going through that process of building the models. What you don't have to do is to leave that window open and go and get yourself a cup of tea before you can continue work. Unfortunately for yourselves, you can run everything in parallel. So we can see we can be running a model. So at this particular point, you can see the model that I kicked off is running. But you can see other experiments that have been built. So let's go to this model here that someone's created already on this data set. This gives you a good view of the current accuracy. It's got a test score associated to it. We evaluated on AUC and it had the value 646. So let's go into that. So once a model is finished running, basically you will get information uh, displayed to you. So the, th the wheel at the top will convert into this, and then you get a bit of summary information in the bottom right-hand corner and some variable importance statistics. So if you're following along with me, feel free to go into a, a run experiment. Things to point out is if you want to understand what has happened at a high level, have a look in the bottom right-hand corner. So we can start to see information about the settings, what the data was that we built the model on, what the test data set was, um, what that target column looked like. The key thing that I really find, every time I demonstrate uh, this product, really amazing, is the feature engineering part. So this model, how long did it take to run? So this model took, in total, about two minutes to build. It originally had 25 columns on it. But as part of its automatic feature engineering, we created 822 new features, and the engine felt that 38 of them were predictive enough to go into its final model. And this is where you as a data scientist really get the performance gain. To create 822 features in code would have taken you a long time. So we're now at this point where we've got a model built in two minutes, and it's a model that is hopefully, highly accurate. So that's the first thing that I want, want to do. So that's, we'll, we'll explore this in more detail in a little bit later on, but we, we're at a point where we've now got an experiment. One thing that I do just want to do is to show you how it's different, and it's subtly different, if I want to apply a... Um, forecasting recipe. So I'm talking about this concept called a recipe. So we had the, a recipe 
i.e. a thought process that the Kaggle Grandmasters have gone, to, gone through to solve a particular uh, data science problem. So the problem that we were solving there was a traditional predictive modeling problem. But what we may want to do is to solve a forecasting problem where we've got time as a dimension. So again, you need to make sure your data is of the right structure. So this cannabis data is of the right structure. It's got one row per time period of sales of this product. Um, so this one, the variable that I want to forecast is this demand variable. So this log 1p demand. So I select that. And the only thing that you have to change that's different from the other methodology that I showed you was you specify a time column. So if you specify a time column to be sales date, what then happens is you get some further options in that top left-hand corner. Because now we've switched it from a traditional predictive modeling problem to a time series forecasting problem. So there's some additional things that we will want to set. Some of the things that you may want to set would be uh, to produce a forecast per store or per store um, and per product line, maybe. So what you're able to do is cr to create grouping columns. So we're grouping on sales date, but we may also want to group by organization. So in this particular case, retailer. So we click on done there. What we also need to give it is a, a clue on how far into the future do we want to forecast. So here we can specify a number of different time periods. So I think I've got, so I've got daily data. I may want to do a forecast three days into the future. But then what also comes up is something that's referred to as a um, gap. So basically that wording says, after how many days do you want to start predicting by? So what we're doing is defining, we're at a time point here. How many gaps do we want to occur after that time point before we start forecasting? And this is important sometimes for retail use cases where I can't forecast tomorrow because tomorrow is too soon. I have to have a specific lead time and I'm at time point T and I can only start forecasting maybe a week in advance. So I want to create a gap of seven before I do my time series forecasting. And that's what that bit allows you to do. So you can collect, you can change that and then you click launch experiment. The reason that this recipe, it's crucial to specify sales date is the challenge that you have with forecasting problems is you need to make sure date is kept in a consistent form. When you do sampling and create cross-validation data sets, you can't just randomly select a cross-validation across multiple dates. You have to keep your date dimension in place and have various uh, rolling windows. So that's what the time series recipe does. Make sure that you solve the problem maintaining date as a factor. Everything else is exactly the same. You go and launch your experiment. It then looks at features and creates new features. But based on the fact we're now dealing with time series data. So it would create features uh, based on date. So it start to extract maybe the day of the week, um, the month, the year. Um, it will start to then consider lags of particular features and lags of the target variable when creating additional new features. So let's go back to hands-on. So this is... What I want you to do now for the next sort of 10 minutes is for you to start to have a play around with driverless AI and building some of these experiments. So let's get you building a predictive model. Feel free to use the credit card data 
feel free to use the cannabis data, but just focus on building an experiment, play around with those expert settings, get an understanding of those expert settings, and get to a point where at least maybe one of those experiments gets to a point where you see these big buttons. And once you get to these big buttons, we'll then restart, and um, I'll start to explain some of these big buttons to you. Technical term, that is, the big buttons. Okay? So have a play around with that. Any questions, feel free to raise a hand, ask a question, or um, ask it on Slido.
So I can't see, so on this screen, Okay, just, just one thing that we just wanted to point out um, with regards to the asking um, of questions. So fortunately, I don't have to answer every single question that you guys um, put, put up there. Marius is doing some answering of the questions at the back as well. So when you go on to Slido, what you will see is some of those questions that you've asked with replies to those. Okay, so if you have asked some specific questions on Slido, then the reply is there. I would love to take credit for all of those. Um, however, it's, it's Marius at the back um, that's answering all of those. Okay, so if we just spend a, a couple more minutes um, going through that, uh, and then we'll start to, once you're at this point, you're at that point where we We've built a model, um, and we've got a certain level of accuracy. Anyone got? So I, I wander around. that gives you just a quick initial view of how to build a model. Um, we are going through this at a rapid pace, so as I said, right at the end, we will have an opportunity just con to consolidate all of that learning. But I'm very conscious that driverless has got a lot of 
key features to it, and I want to bring out a lot of those uh, for you. So if you go into an experiment, if you haven't managed to complete your experiment, um, then feel free to open uh, an experiment that's run um, that has got the status of done. Um, so, so you can see those big buttons. So what do those big buttons allow you to do? Well, the first big button that I want you to look at is the Download Experiment Summary button. The Download Experiment Summary button basically takes everything that you've done, or well, everything that Driverless AI has done, and packages that up into a, a report that you can then share with your external stakeholders. So you all, I, th I believe you're, most of you are data scientists. Who has to write documentation as part of their model building process? So majority of you. Who likes doing it? Probably none of you. So this is, this is a tool that ticks the checkbox of you have to write documentation, but you get someone else to do it for you. So. What happens is when you download the experiment summary, you get a zip file. Um, you can open up that zip file. You get access to a lot of the underlying results um, in various file format. But the magic document that you want is a document called report. And this is a Word document that has gone through everything that driverless AI has built up. So what you have here is information about the experiment. So just some quick overview of how many features were considered, how many features were built into that model. And then you start to see, well, what data was used? Uh, what were the settings that were used as part of driverless? What version was used? So a lot of this documentation has been built with a number of the first adopters of driverless AI technology. And a lot of those early adopters were financial organizations, with financial organizations being heavily regulated specifically around their credit scoring models. So what this has enabled them to do is to have information about the data that was fed into driverless, make sure that the shifts, any shifts were detected, what the assumptions were with the model, what the process was, uh, how many models were considered, how long did it take to build, all these configuration options. Um, some of these configuration options you may be looking at going, well, I didn't set those options. And you'll be right. You didn't set the options, but the system did. And those are all those config settings that sit behind the scenes. So if you have trouble sleeping, uh, feel free to download this report and you can have a, a read through it. But regulators love this stuff. Pardon? <laughs> yeah. Regulators love this stuff um, and it allows you to back up why the model was built. You've got then, what, what is important is sometimes when you look at that screen within driverless AI, you get a variable name, and you look at it and go, what actually is that variable? The num to te. What you do get in this report is uh, an English translation of what that variable represents. Well, when I say an English translation, it's written in English, but sometimes um, it's a bit geeky, even for me. Um, but you can see all of those variables that are in the model, what that final model was, how it was built, and the performance of that. And then some goodness of fit statistics as well. So very, very comprehensive. And all I've done to create that is press a button. So that's one great thing. Um, another thing that data scientists always ha hate is once you've built a model, it's only a value if you then can deploy it. If you still take weeks to deploy a model, 
then all you've done is shifted the bottleneck from building a model to deploying a model. So what we have is the capability to turn that model, as Marius said, into either a Python scoring object. So the button that you press is download Python scoring pipeline. Or you can create a mojo. And a mojo allows you to deploy this model as a Java object. So anywhere that this model needs to execute, all it will need is either Python, if you're deploying into Python, or it will need Java. You don't need to go back to a H2O environment to do the scoring. Why is that important? Well, you may be building machine learning applications or machine learning models that you want to deploy away from a cloud environment, maybe directly to where the data is being generated, i.e. on a mobile phone. Well, your mobile phone isn't going to be running H2O. Your mobile phone isn't going to be running Python, but it probably be running uh, a Java object in some way. So you now have an object that you can deploy into an application that runs on a, a specific device. So you've got flexibility, which isn't then hooking you to doing scoring in a cloud environment. In the next version of driverless AI, um, what we will be doing is deploying the model as a C++ object um, as well. So a number of IT or, uh, departments have said, we want that model as a C++ object. Well, we'll be able to do that in 1.7, which is av hopefully available very, very soon. So those um, uh, options that you can run, there are a few others. So you can uh, download those predictions uh, to have a look at in maybe another visualization tool if you wanted to integrate it into maybe Tableau or Click. Um, you can score another data set from within driverless AI using this particular model. So that's what I call the ad hoc scoring method. You're not going to productionize that, but you may want to score that. But the other button, the other key button that you want to press is interpret this model. So at the moment, We've taken data, we've worked out what are the best features that go into a predictive model or machine learning model, and we've decided what algorithm we're going to use and what hyperparameters are going to be associated to that specific algorithm. And we've done that all in a completely semi-lights-out way. You've, you've seen the logic that it's applied, and we've uh, got a highly accurate result. But what we then want to do is to interpret that model, really start to understand how those predictions have been generated. By clicking on the interpret this model button allows us to do that. So in true Blue Peter fashion, so this dates me, and it also shows that I watched a lot of kids' TV program um, when I was younger. But in true Blue Peter fashion, um, here's one I've prepared earlier. So if I go into the MLI place of driverless, I get into some of the interpreted models. If I click on one of these, it gives me a wealth of information with regards to interpretability. And this could seem fairly overwhelming, first of all. So what I'm going to do is guide you through some of the important bits of this particular screen. So the first bit that I want to take you to is the dashboard. And if I take you to the dashboard, this is where it gives you a summary of some of the key interpretability measures of this particular model. So the key thing that we want of these machine learning models, especially if we want more and more adoption, is we want to make sure that they're fair. We want to make sure that they're accountable for the decision making that they make. We want to make sure they're transparent, and we want to make sure that they're explainable. And all of these graphs help you on the journey to hitting those four dimensions. 
So if we start off with the graph in the top right-hand corner, the graph in the top right-hand corner is very similar to the graph that you saw with regard, uh, with, within your experiments area. But the difference being now is that rather than looking at the feature importance of the new variables that have cr been created, which could be incredibly complicated, as Marius went through um, earlier, there's lots of different feature engineering that's going on. And you as a data scientist has got to explain this back to a business user. And even in explaining, oh, the model, the key feature in a model is the interaction between gender and income, it's quite hard to explain to a business user. So what we're doing with this feature importance is going back to the original variables that went into the model to understand what are the key driving factors of this model. And they're ranked from highest down to lowest. So in this particular experiment, the feature of status one was the most predictive variable, followed by status two, followed by status three and status four. So some business users would go, okay, that's, that's useful. But then the next question that they'll ask is, okay, you've said status one is important, but what is the relationship between status one and the thing that we're trying to predict? So if we increase the value of status one, what impact does that have on my predictions? Do they go up or do they go down or do they stay the same? To get the answer to that question, you can go into the bottom right-hand corner. If you go to the bottom right-hand corner, you create a partial dependency plot. Or rather, uh, driverless AI creates a partial dependency plot for you. And you can navigate through each of those variables, um, seeing how does that variable correlate with the target variable once the model has been built. So we can start to see, as we, in this case, I've selected status three, as I increase the value of status three, the probability of defaulting an, on a loan is going up a little bit and then starts to level off. Okay. So that's the, a second way that we explain the results. The third way that we explain the results is start to use predictive modeling or machine learning algorithms to predict the predictions. And that's what you see in the bottom left-hand corner. So bottom left-hand corner gives you a decision tree that is being used to predict the predictions. Why is this important? Well, you can start to then see some business rules that drive you to a high prediction or to a, a low prediction through a model. So you can now start to go to the business. Well, if a customer had a status one value of one and they had a status two value of 0 0.2 and a status six value of two, three, four, or something else, then their probability to default is quite high. If, however, you go down the left-hand branch, their probability is quite low. So that's what a decision tree allows you to do uh, in this particular context. And then at the top, you have um, a K-Lime explanation. So people come across Lime or K-Lime before. Few hands. It's just another approximation method to take the outputs of your model and see if we can create logic or reason codes behind that. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So if I go and find the surrogate models here, so K-Lime. So I can go into this K-Lime plot. And what I start to see is what my younger daughter would go, that just looks like a mass of stars. It just looks like a galaxy. And should be right, I suppose. Uh, it's a lot of just dots. But what are the important things to take home here? The first important thing to take home is this R squared value. So for the reason codes that come out of 
uh, this k-line plot, you want to have an R squared that is high. Because what you're saying is this model is a good approximation of the probabilities that are coming out of the driverless model. So the closer that is to 100%, the better th this is as an approximation method. So that's the first thing that you want to pull out. The second thing that you want to pull out is when you click on explanations. If you click on explanations, you then get information about what are the positive contributions to that score and what are the negative contributions to that score. So what we can see is if someone has a status one value of one, then their probability on average increases by about 0.22. If they have a status three value of one, it increases by 0.16. If a status six value increases by six. So here we've got the highest contributions and the negative contributions as well because there will be some that as we have a value, so in this particular case, status two has a value of minus two, it de decreases the probability of defaulting on a loan by 0.13. And if you click on the uh, go to additional um, features, you get a whole list of them. So you can start to see your reason codes for the overall model. But these are what we call global reason codes. Reason codes of how the model is making the decision. But what we know is that this data probably has groups of people. Groups of people um, that are similar in their characteristics. So the K represents how many groups of people or accounts could we create to make a better approximation. So every person gets put into one of K groups. In this particular case, we've got 14 groups. And again, what Driverless has done is had a look at the data and work out how many segments do we have within our data. And what this allows us to do is we can go to an individual data point if we wanted and say, what are the reasons specifically of that data point, so I'll just select a data point at random. This data point here, in the top left-hand corner, is customer number 13,664. It's gone to cluster 12, so there's a few people in this cluster. Our R squared is high, which is good. And now when I go to my explanations, not only do I get... Um, global reason codes, I also get local reason codes as well. So local reason codes are what are the reason codes that are specific to this particular customer that made them have a high score or a low score. So in this particular point, I can see the model. So the, the probability of default, the actual value for this customer was they defaulted on a loan. The model said that they would, they had a 41% chance of defaulting on a loan. The Lime approximation said 0.42. So these, so the accuracy of these Lime values are very, very good. So they can be taken quite literally as really good approximations. So these are the values that this customer had. They had a status one value of one that increased the probability by 0.22. They had a status value of five with a value of two, which only increased their probability by 0.046. So these are reason codes that are fairly easy to explain back to a business of how was the overall model decision made, but how was an individual decision made as well. And this is really important when you're maybe doing scoring of transactions in real time, where you potentially want these reason codes to be calculated in the same way as your model predictions are created as well. So you may be building a model that predicts whether or not a transaction is fraudulent. 
once you identify if transactions fraudulent, you then want reason codes of how that model made the decision. So you can feed that into an operational system that then goes to a human to start to explain why a particular transaction has maybe been rejected. Um, so that's how K-Line works and what is available um, through that. A lot of this work with regards to model explainability is new and constantly evolving. At the back, there's a red book. I can't remember the title of it, but it's a red book that is all about the theory with regards to a lot of this stuff that you're seeing on the, on the screen. So feel free to, to grab a copy of that. Um, remember, though, these methodologies that we talk about here are approximations. Some organizations, specifically financial organizations, don't want an approximation. They want the mathematical inner workings of those models. So there's been a lot of work of how do we get those mathematical exact values. And the SHAP value, or the Shapley value, allows you to see the exact contributions for each of those features of the model. And these are really important specifically within credit scoring. So credit scoring um, has been a lot of work just done in the last 24 months of using machine learning algorithms and opening up those machine learning algorithms, allowing them to be explained to the regulators about how those decisions are being made. And that's where Shapley values have been incredibly useful and valuable. The downside with them, because there's always a downside, there's nothing as a free lunch. The downside is they take a very long time to calculate. So if you've got hundreds of thousands of accounts or millions of accounts, you do have to wait um, some time for those to execute. And what we're trying to do is how do we make that process more efficient running across um, a, a, a large CPU estate um, or a, a large GPU estate. So, what I've hopefully done is given you a view into driverless AI. We've got you to a point where you've brought in some data, you've run an experiment, you've had a look at the experiment results. Now what, it, look at, so it's 20 past seven now, so now, feel free to go through any of these particular uh, tasks. Feel free to go through those data sets, maybe try different experiment settings, maybe try running some uh, different interpretability results and understanding how that's building up, um, and just freestyle it. Just play with it. If you break it, that well, you can't really break it, but if you feel you've broken it, then the Amazon server would just come down anyway in, a, in an hour's time. Okay. So any burning questions, any things that you want me to show while, on, while I'm up here? Okay, we've got two questions. Yeah. Yeah, so the okay. Yeah. So so it's always yeah. Yeah, so it's always going back to the original data. Um so you're right, if there was some sort of labeling or mapping, yeah. the reason that you have such a small number is you only need eight bytes of storage, for example, for minus one. Whereas if you've got a full description, you just need more storage space. So, but it's a good point. We maybe want to put in some sort of mapping or labeling. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good, it's a good point. And I'll feed that back to engineering. Excellent. Thank you. And that's one, one thing, again, that 
Um, I've worked in the software industry for a while. One big difference that we have is how connected our customers are with our engineering. So as soon as you become a customer of H2O, you really are the product managers of how our software then evolves. So I'll feed that back. There was another question. Someone had their hand up. Hi, yeah. I think I might have just... I might have just discovered the answer to the question I did have, but I was just a little bit confused about the SHAP value plot. You've got a global score and a local score. I wasn't sure what the local score was, but then I've just noticed in the top left you've got a box where it says row number. Yeah. Um, so the local score, that is calculated based on the cluster that that row belongs to, is that? Correct. That, that's Correct. right. That local score is assigned to that specific local, uh, that specific observation. To get rid of that local score, just delete that number. I think we just there we go, and then you're back to the the global Shapley values. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, excellent. Okay, so as as I said, it's it's up to you now. We want you to have as much hands-on um, of driverless uh, as possible, but I wanted to make sure I navigated you through that. Um, so hopefully you found that useful. We're going to be around for um, quite a bit more time. Um, so feel free to play. Marius is at the back. Ask him the hard questions, only because he's more likely to answer them <laughs> or have the ability to answer them than I have. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll, we'll be around.